Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. So thanks very much for uh, coming to this talk, part of the TropMed series. So I'm going to talk about um, the Ebola clinical trials we've been involved in. Um, we've given a few talks, but mostly around the logistics and the, the difficulties of running the trials, etc. So I'll be presenting the results of, of one of the trials um, that we've been conducting. Um, so this is called the RAPID platform, which we set up with Wellcome Trust funding. Uh, so it stands for Rapid Assessment of Potential Interventions and Drugs for Ebola. So the idea was to set up a platform where we could look at more than one of the therapeutic interventions uh, and support a number of groups. Um, and so we actually did set up and run clinical trials in Ebola treatment units in West Africa and we had Oxford University staff going into the high risk zone, uh, enrolling patients into studies and giving them experimental treatments. So I'll, I'll just start with the acknowledgements rather than at the end. Um, obviously this is a huge team effort uh, with investigators in Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, and with the NGOs who are basically running most of the treatment centres, so Medicines on Frontier and Gold Global, and then with Public Health England who are running the labs, uh, and then many other groups. Um, a topic for another talk is really the support the university gave. This was a, a, a huge endeavour in terms of um, logistics of staff, health and safety, um, all sorts of issues that the staff dealt with, including you know, liabilities um, both for the patients but also for university staff who were in very high risk conditions uh, and also for the uh, NGOs who were running the units who were very worried that we might actually, by running the trials, disrupt the service um, that they were giving because there had been riots around some of the Ebola treatment centres. So it was a um, I think a great achievement of the university actually that they were brave enough to support this kind of uh, very high risk research. So the ball started rolling for us 14th of August 2014 where there was a WHO meeting uh, of experts who decided that there were a number of experimental therapeutics for Ebola uh, and it was decided that these the situation was so grave that these should be fast tracked into clinical trials. Um, and that we had a moral duty to evaluate these interventions in the best possible clinical studies that could be conducted under the circumstances. Um, so that was when uh, uh, researchers then decided that we would try and evaluate these drugs as best we could and the funders stepped forward and did rapid access um, funding to set these up. There are a number of promising candidates which many of you will have heard of. ZMAP was the, the one of the most promising candidates which is a, an antibody cocktail which was showed very good effect in monkeys. There was this drug PK Ebola, which is an RNA inhibitor, which showed protection in monkeys. There was Brinzidofovir, a small antiviral molecule. Favipiravir, another antiviral molecule. And obviously convalescent plasma, which had been used in the past, but there really wasn't good evidence for its efficacy or, or otherwise, uh, and actually had not worked in, in a monkey model. So these were the most promising interventions. Uh, there was a whole bunch of less promising ones. So uh, many of the labs around the world started looking at repurposed therapies and doing in, in vitro studies to look at inhibition of Ebola virus in the lab. And there was a whole bunch of um, products that showed um, some antiviral activity in the lab. I think the, the repurposed therapies, so drugs that were rec already um, recognised and registered for other uses were quite attractive because that meant that they were already available and we didn't have production issues. At the time we had a massive outbreak across three countries with tens of thousands of cases um, so you wanted a drug that you could scale up. So the, that's why these were, were uh, of, of interest. Uh, they acted at different points in the replication cycle so TK and Ebola and convalescent plasma would, would bind with the virus and stop it binding to the cell and entering the cell to replicate. Um, TKM Ebola interferes with um, messenger RNA, so stops production of the proteins. And then some of the other drugs like favipiravir, brinzidofovir, um, interfere with the transcription and replication process in, in the cell. So we were involved in three studies. So TKM Ebola and brinzidofovir were studies that we ran here. We were, we were the primary investigators in those two studies. And we were also involved in the convalescent plasma studies in Sierra Leone and Guinea. Um, so far, the results of um, favipiravir have been published in PLOS Med, and the results of the convalescent plasma study in Guinea have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. 
I won't talk about the results of those, um, but we can discuss it later if people are interested. So what I'm going to talk about is this study, the TKM Ebola study, because the Brinsted Office study uh, didn't enrol many patients and it was terminated very quickly because the drug company decided to withdraw from Ebola research. So you may have heard some of the talks that have been given about the difficulties of, of, of running these trials, so I won't go into it in great detail. But for those of you who've not heard about it, just to give a very brief background that actually the, the conditions were very rudimentary. Uh, this was the first Ebola outbreak where uh, it was the, the virus was first discovered in Yambuka in um, Congo in 1976, and this was a West African treatment centre in August 2004. It's not a lot of difference, really. And, and the, the, the case fatality rate um, was very similar. So it, in most of those countries, the availability of, of care was extremely limited, um, and most of the health facilities were very rudimentary. And even after the NGOs came in, and there was a, a big push after it was declared a public health emergency to fund the NGOs to set up treatment centres, it still was still, you know, rudimentary. You know, it's a slightly better bed, uh, and there's much better protection for the staff. But as you can see, um, it's, this is not advanced care at all, and this is where the patients are going to the toilet. Um, you know, and apart from giving IV medication, it was very difficult to do any other kind of monitoring of the patients. There was it was a difficult context as well. So there was it was unclear that randomisation would be accepted. There'd been um, quite a lot of resistance to that from the NGOs and from um, members of the public and from um, government officials. Very high case fatality rate and rapid death. Overall, the death rate was about 70% at that time, but it was variable up by age. So if you were a young child or an older adult, then it was approaching 100% mortality. There was a perceived lack of equipoise about the drugs. And what I mean by that is you run clinical trials because you don't know if the drug works or not and you, you're in balance about your consideration about whether the drugs will work or not. But at the same time as we were making those arguments that we didn't know if the drugs worked or not, we were um, chartering planes to fly ZMAP out to Africa to give to healthcare workers, um, foreign healthcare workers who had been infected. And we were flying uh, the UK nurse who got infected over to America so he could give convalescent plasma to an American healthcare worker who got infected, uh, which didn't really give the impression of equipoise about these drugs. It, you know, people really wanted them if they had Ebola because the case fatality was so high. And also uh, a lot of mistrust. There, there was murder of some healthcare workers. There was uh, riots. Several hospitals were set on fire. Um, so a very tense situation at the peak. And then there were practical considerations about running the trials. Nothing really comes out of the Ebola treatment centres. Everything is burnt. Um, before it leaves because of the high risk of infection. So you can't run a normal clinical trial because you know, all, your, all your records, even the consent forms, have to be burnt. Um, so many other challenges, you know, all the data transmission, you, you can't take the medical records out of the treatment zone because of the high risk. So you either have to um, actually verbally transmit the data across to somebody in the safe zone who transcribes it. This was done a lot or you scan it across, so you have a scanner on one side and a cable. Um, you can't do your normal sort of clinical care, you can't really take blood pressure or, or listen to the lungs and the heart because you, you can't put a stethoscope in when you're wearing this kit. People tried putting the stethoscope in and running the, 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 uh, the, the arm and the stethoscope down their arms, but that didn't work very well. Um, Often getting consent was very difficult. Many children admitted, and many very sick patients. Normally you would ask the relatives for consent, uh, but usually the relatives were quarantined. So very difficult then to get consent from those patients where they're quarantined somewhere else. And at one point, when we first started our trial, our healthcare workers who were running the trial got quarantined because there'd been an infection in the healthcare zone. And the same day we enrolled the first patients, half of our trial team were quarantined because there'd been an infection in the camp of the healthcare worker. So many, many challenges, but I won't go into those in great detail. Um, so I just want to talk, so RAPID um, was the platform. So we were trying to rapidly assess and triage these drugs um, using what we called a multi-stage approach. Um, what we wanted to do was try to identify anything that worked very quickly so that we could actually have an impact in this epidemic and not just gather evidence for the future. 
so the trial design considerations. At the time we were designing the trial, it was, it was catastrophic in countries, and there were catastrophic predictions being made that there would be more than 1,000 cases per week. Um, so we wanted to identify if anything worked very quickly so we could actually then try and roll it out during the epidemic and have an impact on transmission and survival. We wanted to really look for a large treatment effect, an odds ratio of two or more. We weren't interested in something that had a, a marginal effect when you've got case fatality rates of 80%. Um, you want to identify something that makes a, a reasonable difference, particularly if you're giving a drug that's hard to give with intravenous infusions. It's got to be worth the risk to the healthcare workers. We wanted to get rid of ineffective treatments quickly, so we didn't want to waste time on a very large trial of something that didn't work. I wanted to be able to discard those and move on to the next one. We did also want to be able to identify moderately effective treatments somewhere in the process, but to have an initial screening triage so we could identify the really good ones early on. Um, and we were working on the basis that usually with drug trials, the efficacy is accrued in multiple stages. You do a phase one for safety, then you do a phase two looking for uh, early evidence of effectiveness, then you do a definitive phase three, and then usually more than one phase three is needed to really prove a drug works and to register it. In terms of um, considering the safety of the drugs, really it's an unusual situation where you've got a very high mortality rate and, and it's very difficult to monitor for non-fatal you know, um, side effects of a drug like derangement of liver function, things like that, very difficult to measure in that circumstance. So we chose mortality as just being the simple endpoint we wanted to look at for both safety and efficacy, that we would terminate it early for lack of effectiveness um, before we looked for sort of other more subtle signs of harm. Um, so we would set futility rules which would stop the trial early if we didn't think we were going to find evidence of effectiveness. And we had safety monitoring of, of you know, severe acute adverse reactions uh, and we had a data safety monitoring board who reviewed every patient's outcome. Normally you would have interim or final analysis where you just look at the patients after you've accrued a certain number. But for this trial, because we wanted a result very quickly, uh, the DSMB looked at the data after every patient met an endpoint. And the DSMB could stop the trial um, for reasons other than the statistical futility boundary if they felt there were concerns about the trial. So this was the overall design, which we called the multi-stage approach, which we published in, in two papers. So we would start with a phase two single arm trial, where we would be basically trying to triage these drugs and categorize them into one of three categories. Either it didn't look like it was going to work and we would set it aside. We wouldn't have proof that it didn't work, you know, because we wouldn't be looking for small effects, but it would not be looking as a promising drug for this outbreak. It would show a good effect very early, very effective, or it would be somewhere in the middle. And we would, I think, then if we were in the middle here, we would then say, okay, we have now got evidence-based equipoise. We now have evidence that it may or may not work and it may be moderately effective and this is, would be the justification for randomization. And then we would move on in different ways depending on the outcome. If, obviously, if, if it didn't look promising, we would just stop. <coughs> If it looked very effective, we would go on to a phase, a bigger phase three rollout confirmatory study without randomization. And if it was anywhere in between, then we would go for a straight RCT, randomized controlled trial. And then there were various options going forward. So the first stage of the multi-stage approach, the phase two trial, we hard end point, so it was day 14 mortality. So are you alive or dead on the 14th day after admission? That was the simple outcome that we measured. Sequential analysis, so every time somebody met day 14, even if they died earlier, we waited till it was day 14, they would be counted as a survivor or a death. That would be reported to the, um, the Data Safety Monitoring Board and would be plotted on our statistical um, plots. Um, and we based the stopping boundaries based on prior data. So we had data from uh, 1,800 patients who'd been admitted in various um, MSF treatment centres and these were the estimates and, and the confidence intervals of the survival rates. And survival was only around 40% across these 1,800 patients. So this was the basis for setting the, the limits around the trial design. Um, we wanted to set the limits so that it was robust to variation in survival. So there was some variation in survival across sites, um, you'll see. Not, not huge, but there was some. But we wanted to be robust to that. So we set the limits quite wide. So the upper boundary was a very high bar. 
We wouldn't declare something very effective just in a phase two trial unless we saw very good evidence. So going from what was currently a 40% survival to an 80% survival, then we would say that this is good evidence, even from a phase two, that this is, there's a big effect and that we should consider rolling this out. Not promising, if we saw survival less than 50%, 50% or less, we would say this is not a promising drug. Uh, we haven't definitively proven that there's not a small effect, but we know we can get around 50% survival with standard care in West Africa. So this is not a promising drug. And anywhere in between, we would say this looks promising, but we have to go forward with more definitive trials and be the justification for a randomised controlled trial. Uh, and this, was, this is a statistical um, representation of, of that table. And so what we would do, we, every, every time somebody reached day 14, we would report that patient um, here, and up here, that would be the number who survived. So if you know, 20 out of 20 survived, you would be here on the plot. And if only 10 out of 20 survived, you'd be here. Uh, and then if you hit this red line, this meant that you were not even by enrolling hundreds of patients, you, you were not going to be able to prove this was better than 50% effective. It was highly unlikely, and you would stop the trial. If you hit the green line, this is the 80% efficacy. You're now statistically showing that um, this is within the boundary of an 80% survival effect. And anywhere in between, when you hit the yellow line, then you've got statistical evidence that it's somewhere in between, and you have to go on to an RCT, because you won't reach a definitive conclusion either way by continuing with this design. So that was the design of the study. So I'll now talk about one of the drugs we used, the TKM130803 trial, which was the small interfering RNA drug. So we used exactly that design for the brinsted offervir trial, but it was stopped very early by the drug company. And then we moved on to this trial. Uh, so it's an RNA interfering drug, so it's a small molecule. It's, um, Basically, the principle is that double-stranded RNA um, molecules can interfere with um, the transcription process um, So, by stimulating degradation of the messenger RNA before it becomes the protein. So it's post-transcriptional gene silencing, so it's, it's an intracellular activity. Um, and so it's basically small double-stranded RNA molecules that go intracellularly and interfere with the replication and production of the proteins of the virus. And so this is the Ebola virus, and, and these are the seven genes. And the drug targets the production of two of the genes, the L polymer, two of the um, proteins, the L polymerase protein and the VP35. They're involved in replication and are necessary for replication. And this is the product. So it's basically, it has to be intracellular to work. So it has to you know, interfere with viral replication in the cell. So it's put into a, into a lipid formulation, so it's taken up into the cell. Um, so you have this lipid um, outer boundary and inside is these the pieces of RNA that interfere with the replication process. And that had been shown in <coughs> a monkey model of an earlier strain of Ebola, the, Guinea, um, the Kikwit strain, to, um, to improve survival in the monkey model, which is the best animal model, uh, where they experimentally infect the monkey and then um, give them the drug after infection and it improves survival. We did have a problem, though, in that the, the drug that had been developed was based on the earlier strains of the virus, uh, but the new strain that evolved in West Africa was different. So on a, you know, a genetic phylogeny, um, you can see that the, this is one of the earlier papers in October 2014, that the, that the Guinea patients, and we had also had data from Sierra Leone, uh, actually it's a slightly different virus. And this is a problem because we're targeting the you know, the, the sequence of the virus. So we had to get the drug adapted to the new strain. Because we looked at the, at the strain, these are the old strains, Kikwit, to which the, um, this is the drug, the, the sequence of the, of the sRNA, targeting um, this bit of the genome. And these are the old strains to which this was developed. And there's a mismatch. There were two nucleotide substitutions, which meant that the drug now did not match the currently circulating virus, either in the VP35 or in the L pole. So in both um, of the components, there had been a substitution in the new virus, which meant the drug wasn't a good match. 
So the drug company very quickly, and that, I think that's one of the advantages of this technology, because it's small, you know, just small lengths of RNA, you can, you can reproduce and, uh, and modify it. Um, SIVP35-2 was the old um, version of the, of the VP35 interfering RNA, and SIL-POL2 was the old one. Um, these were the old viruses, these are the new viruses, and so they produced a new, a new product, which where the <coughs> nucleotides match the currently circulating strain in both of the both of the um, both of the products that are in the drug, <coughs> and then they rapidly tested this in a um, monkey model using the new strain of virus to infect the, the monkey. So this is the Macona. Uh, it's now called the Macona um, viral strain, um, and in the Macona uh, challenge model, where you give it to the monkeys, if you give the drug s up to 72 hours after infection. Um, you see improved survival. So these, here is the, um, in red is the monkeys who are not given the drug and they all die very quickly. And the monkeys who were given the, the new virus and then treated with the new version of the drug, um, there was good survival. So this was the biological um, evidence that this drug was worth trying in humans. So what we got, we got um, this new, new drug, we got it, um, it was adjusted to match the guinea strain it was a wet formulation. Normally it's a lyophilized version, but they didn't have time to produce that, so we had a wet formulation. Um, the treatment is difficult. It's IV infusion once daily over two hours. So we had an experimental drug, so never been given to, to humans, never been given to Ebola patients. We have to infuse it over two hours, and we have to observe the patients because there had been um, adverse reactions in some of the earlier phase one studies, uh, and we have to do that in an Ebola treatment center. Seven days of treatment, and we only had 100 treatment courses. That was all they could produce. So we had a very limited um, scope of a trial we could do because we only had 100, up to 100 treatment courses. So we, we adapted the statistics. With only 100 treatment courses, we went for just a futility design where we were not with 100 doses ever going to be able to you know, prove this, very unlikely to prove this drug is very effective, but we could see if it was futile quite early. So we just kept the bottom boundary, the red boundary, um, and said that if, you know, if we hit this red boundary, there'd be evidence that the drug wasn't effective or was dangerous and we would stop the trial. So again, the outcome was the same, was 14 day survival. We slightly adjusted the parameters um, because uh, we now had to give this only to adults. Um, so we reanalyzed the data and adjusted the boundary. So we were looking for survival better than 55%. Um, and we started the trial. So these are the results. So first of all, when the trial started, so this is the outbreak in, I think it's yeah, Sierra Leone. Um, the convalescent whole blood trial started first. That was in Guinea. That was because it's not an experimental drug, so you have a lot of the less of the regulatory issues. They had to set up you know, transfusion, etc. but there are mobile transfusion units which they could send out, so they were able to do that. Um, the JICI trial, which is the Favipiravir trial, opened here. Our Brinsidofovir trial opened quite soon after, but unfortunately closed very quickly. Then another convalescent plasma trial, this is the one we were involved in, opened. Then ZMAP opened, and then we opened here. So at the tail end of the epidemic, unfortunately. And so this is the, the primary result. So we, we screened 34 patients of which 19 were eligible, the others were uneligible because they were either children who were excluded or they died very quickly or were too sick to be in the trial and two didn't, we didn't, couldn't get consent. Uh, so we enrolled 17. We had an observational cohort, so because we had to um, give the infusion over two hours and we had to observe the patients before treatment, during the whole two hours and after treatment, and then at two, four and eight hours and you can only stay in the treatment center for inside the hot zone for a maximum of an hour. You had to have a big team just to monitor one patient. So we had big teams um, rotating in and out with sometimes pay people having to go in three, three or four times into the hot zone every day to monitor the patient. So we had a limit on the number we could have enrolled at any one time. And so if we reached that limit, the number of patients we could have enrolled at any one time, then patients would go into an observational cohort. So we had 14 were treated. We excluded two because what we had, the outcome at 
uh, 14 days, excluded those who died within 48 hours because sometimes patients came in moribund. And a lot of discussion about whether we should include or exclude them, but it was felt that if patients came in extremely sick and died very quickly, it was unlikely that any drug would save them and we shouldn't really include them in the primary analysis. So two were excluded because they died in 48 hours. Uh, so we had 12 in the primary analysis. Um, median age of 36 years, we had an 85-year-old admitted who was involved in the trial. The, the number of days from onset to admission was a median of two days, but I will take that with a pinch of salt. We're not really um, convinced about that, that data and people weren't always um, clear about when they started their illness. Wet symptoms, so diarrhea and vomiting, is associated with more severe Ebola. Uh, and 11 of the 17 patients, total 17 patients, have diarrhea or vomiting on admission. And five of the 17 had evidence of bleeding complications on admission, which is also an indicator of severity. So we had some very severe patients admitted. And this is dem demonstrated by the viral loads as well. So the, the pre-treatment, so before they had any intervention, geometric um, viral load in the 14 TK <coughs> patients was um, 2.2 times 10 to the 9, so extremely high viral loads associated with a very high risk of death. And in all the patients, all 17 patients, the viral load was very high, 10 to the 9. So we had um, very sick patients, both clinically and virologically. Um, and this is what happened. So we enrolled patients, and at 14 days they were reported whether to be alive or dead. And the reason we only enrolled that small number of patients is because we hit the futility line very quickly. Um, so of the 12 patients who were included in the analysis because they died, or, or they lasted longer than 48 hours, nine of them died and only three survived. So very quickly we hit the futility boundary that it was clear that in the patients we enrolled, the survival rate was very bad. Either this drug is not very effective or it's even potentially harmful. Um, so we stopped the trial. And the final analysis, the, um, the survival rate in those 12 patients was only 27%. Um, and as you see, the, the confidence interval um, is just over 55%. And that's, that's, the statistics were designed for that. When the 95% confidence interval is near your, your target, then we would have to stop the trial because there's no likelihood of us ever showing this drug to have a good survival in these patients. So that's why we had a small number of patients was because very quickly it was clear we were not saving lives. And three patients in the observational cohort and two died. So very high case fatality rates. And it was associated with viral load. So this is the PCR copies, so much higher in those who died than those who survived. And that's the CT value, which is the, the converse. So, um, but the same result. Uh, funnily enough, it was well tolerated Actually, there was a lot of concerns about this drug because in the phase one studies and in some compassionate use in patients uh, in the US, we'd seen cytokine release reactions where patients had got quite sick with hypertension and, and pains and fevers and the drug had had to be stopped. So this is one of the big concerns and that's why we monitored the patients throughout the whole two hours of the infusion and very frequently afterwards because we were worried about the transfusion reactions. Uh, we gave 56 infusions, so 56 two-hour infusions, um, and they were all well tolerated. We saw no, um, we didn't have to slow the infusion, we didn't have to terminate the infusion. There was only one possible infusion-related reaction where the, somebody's breathing that was fast already got faster. So the drug was well tolerated, which we were actually surprised about, but it may be that the patients are so sick that you can't really induce any more cytokine release because they already have very high cytokine levels. Uh, and this, was, this shows the tolerability of the drug clinically. So these were the observations pre-infusion and then during the infusion and then at the end of the infusion and then at one, two, four and eight hours after the infusion, which was all the observations we did on every patient. This is the heart rate, um, respiratory rate, um, blood pressure and temperature. And really it was pretty flat. So we didn't see any indication of people reacting adversely to the drug infusion at any time point. So the conclusion was that at the dose we gave it, which was 0.3 milligrams per kilogram per day, and to the patients we gave it to, who they were all very severe, um, it didn't show any improvement in survival compared to historic controls, and so we stopped the trial. Um, 
So a bit of speculation about why the outcomes were, were not good in the patients. Late stage disease. So the monkey, in the monkey models, they, give, they experimentally infect the monkey, so they know when the, the, the monkey is infected, and then they give the drug, you know, 72, and the, the longest that it's been given is five days, that was for Zemat, was five days after infection. But the mean incubation period in humans is nine to ten days, and patients are coming in two days after symptom onset. So you're actually uh, seeing patients who are 10 to 14 days after infection, and in the monkey models, you're giving the drug you know, three to five days after infection, and that's a big difference. So it's, it's a controlled infection in monkeys, but in, in the field, you can't really determine when patients come. Uh, and unfortunately, they don't come till they're symptomatic, obviously, and often late in disease. And we saw patients with very high viral load and, and end organ damage with wet symptoms and bleeding. Um, so it may be that it's a function of we were treating the most severe patients, and that's why we didn't see a, an effect and that nothing could rescue patients who were that sick. Um, was the virus different? We'd seen earlier that, the, that the, the drug had been developed for the older strain and then the strain had changed in Guinea and the drug was adapted, but there may have been further change during the epidemic so that there was actually a drift away from the drug and it was a bit different. Um, or even that we were selecting for resistance because it's targeting these viruses you could actually select out drugs that have a different um, sequence and a bit resistance. Um, so we got full genomes from 10 patients. Um, and basically, they, they weren't a special subset of patients. Their, their viruses, which is the, the blue arrows, were distributed throughout the whole phylogeny of the Sierra Leone outbreak. So we weren't seeing a special, because we, we were using one particular Ebola treatment centre, and perhaps there was a, a, you know, a different strain in that particular area that was more virulent than others. Um, there's no evidence of that. It was the, the viruses were pretty distributed across the, all the viruses in Sierra Leone, so it didn't seem to be a different virus. And then we looked at the match of the target in the virus to the drug. So again, this is re-showing the slide. This is the new um, product that's been adapted to the earlier guinea strains and so we did a, the same matching for our patients uh, and it was a perfect match so this is the target um, that the drug was developed for and these are the um, sequences from the patients who were treated with the drug and there's a perfect match concordance with the drug and the virus that the patients were infected with so the match between the drug and the virus was perfect so it, w it wasn't that um, could be the drug dose. We gave 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Who knows what the, what the optimal target you know, is. Um, we chose that based on the optimal dose in monkeys was higher. They saw an effect at 3 milligrams per kilogram per day. The optimal dose was 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per, per day in monkeys. But in the phase one use of this drug in healthy volunteers, the maximum tolerated dose was 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Um, so that was why we chose that dose. But given that actually the drug was well tolerated in the patients who were very sick, we may be that, it may be that we could have actually pushed that dose up a, quite a lot. Um, and we also don't know how the drug behaves in, in very sick patients who've got diarrhea and vomiting. And, you know, it's given intravenous, but they may have a different volume distribution, etc. So we have um, pre- and post-infusion samples, which we're doing um, pharmacokinetics on now. We've got the first set of results, but we really haven't had a chance to look at those properly um, to tell us if um, we're getting therapeutic, potentially therapeutic doses. So, and, and just lastly, to finish with some lessons, um, you know, the drug was not demonstrated to be effective in those patients, but the trial was a success in that we managed to do the trial, and you know, trials are about finding an answer, and we found an answer. Um, and it was conducted to international standards. We actually had a GCP, a good clinical practice inspection during the trial um, by the Sierra Leone authorities and also an inspection by WHO and the trial was conducted to international standards. Um, but we do need better routine data available um, during outbreaks because that would have helped us, I think, um, parameterize the trial much better in terms of doing stratified analysis by um, viral load, etc. Uh, and that data 
was collected but wasn't readily available for various reasons and that's one of the, the, the big issues because we can do much better clinical research if we have better data and data's there but it's not shared for various reasons um, adaptive design so we you know we adapted the trial design um, because of the context we changed from the full multi-stage approach to just a futility design based on the the, um, the conditions before us it was an adaptive design in, in terms of what happened at the next stage would depend on what happened in the first stage and the ZMAP trial is also an adaptive design where they actually have adaptive randomization so they change the randomization ratios based on interim analysis so we've shown that those designs are possible and are probably actually essential in a trial in a trial like this way you're working on unknown parameters and data will come in during your trial so you do need to build it so you can adapt it um, based on new new evidence um, arising but we still need to improve you know, clinical science and outbreaks you know we started the trial too late for various reasons um, if we'd started it earlier um, we may have had uh, well we may have had a different result we may not but um, I think some of the other trials suffered from starting too late as well. Um, and I think for other outbreaks, we have to deal with other issues like small numbers. You know, the Ebola outbreak was very big, but it lasted a very long time. And most outbreaks are only about six weeks and the numbers are small. And you have to design trials that really can um, cope with the small numbers and the heterogeneity also of treatment centers and the uncertainty of, of, of epidemics. And that's our, some of our trial team members in in the inside the unit just as they've finished doing some observations on a patient. Thank you very much and I'll take any questions if there are.